Um, so now we're actually moving into the critique portion of the three-phase program, and so we'll be having a panel on improving the path to research and commercialization in Texas. Um, this panel will be moderated by Mr. Am Adam Hamilton. He's the president and CEO of Southwest Research Institute. Uh, Southwest Research Institute is one of the nation's largest independent providers of advanced scientific and applied technology solutions. They're a not-for-profit 501c3 conducting more than $600 million of research each year. And the institute provides solutions for some of humankind's most pressing problems in environments from the deep sea to deep space and practically everywhere in between. The institute was founded in 1947 and Mr. Hamilton became only the fourth president to serve in October of 2014. Um, so please welcome uh, Mr. Adam Hamilton and the, our panelists to the stage. Oh, we got to move down one. Sorry. I got it. Well, good morning. What a great conference. I think it would be appropriate to take just a moment to thank the TAMIS organization and the TAMIS staff for making this happen. If you're um, part of this organization, please accept our, our thanks and appreciation. How about a round of applause for TAMIS? Well, the uh, topic, improving the path to research and commercialization in Texas is something that uh, we came up with collectively. Uh, but when I started to think about that title, I think it summarizes some of the issues that we as technical people, for the most part, have with innovation, in that we call it a path. And to me, when I think about a path, that would infer some unidirectional component. So we have great ideas. We have great technologies. How do we make those better and get those to the market? How do we cross that so-called valley of death? Well, what I'm learning as, um, as CEO of Southwest Research Institute and from many of the, the great people in this audience and elsewhere is that really the ecosystem is perhaps a higher fidelity model of innovation that we need to apply. It's not just about crossing the valley of death because again, that implies that we're pushing this technology to the market. And really, it would be more beneficial if we pushed, but we also had that pull. So we'll try to focus our comments today mostly on these ecosystems. So now, as I mentioned, um, I, I have the honor of being the president of Southwest Research Institute, and it truly is an honor. And as we go about our mission, which is here, we encounter many different types of ecosystems. We work in space. NASA, in fact, is our, our biggest client. But we also work in the transportation sector, pharmaceutical sector, defense, intelligence, chemistry. And all of these seem to have separate ecosystems. But what I'm starting to see, can't quite get my hands around it yet, is really there's some kind of an Uber ecosystem that really encompasses all of these other ecosystems. And a big part of that are the investor community and other parts of the community that we don't typically work with. So if you're not familiar with Swery, just to give you a little perspective, we are an independent, applied, nonprofit R&D organization with a very broad technical base, as I just mentioned. We have a, a lot of very uh, expensive uh, facilities at our campus being there 72 years now, you might imagine. We have 240 buildings and 2.5 million square feet of laboratory space. Our revenues right now are, are growing, thank goodness. And we're based in San Antonio, but we have a large presence in Boulder, Colorado as well. So we say deep sea to deep space, it's worry, because we've worked on everything from the Alvin pressure hole, the Alvin submarine pressure hole, to running uh, humankind's most distant exploration ever for the NASA mission called New Horizons, where we flew by Pluto in 2015, and just over a year ago, an object a billion miles beyond Pluto's orbit that was called Ultima Thule at one time, but now it's been given another name by NASA. So I love the ecosystem analogy, because as an engineer scientist, I think about ecosystems representing some kind of 
life science model where we have biotic and abiotic components. In the analogy in our world of innovation and commercialization might be academia, nonprofits, government, industry, and startups. I'll leave it to you to decide which ones are biotic, which ones are abiotic in that list. We have these nutrient cycles and energy flows. Those equate to information and funding and ideas. We have the production, which equates to growth, return, value, and intellectual property. We have decomposition, which equates to failures, which none of us like to see, but we also uh, recognize as part of the business process. And we have all these external factors as well. So uh, I'm uh, excited and embrace the concept of the ecosystem analogy. Now, I imagine that each one of you probably has a slide presentation of the valley of death. And this is the first time that I really thought about what the arrows on that chart meant. And you noticed I, they're now bi-directional arrows. Usually I had it, we go from <coughs> universities and national laboratories with very basic or fundamental research into the uh, applied research area, product development, and finally to production or commercialization. But now I'm starting to think about this really as a two-way street. It really is an ecosystem where all parts of it contribute and have significance and importance in what we do every day. So why talk about it here at the TAMIS meeting? Well, it's because Texas can do better. As was just mentioned, Texas is number three in research funding. And if you look at um, where we are, that's the, that's the total funding. For federal funding, number seven, industry funding, number five, universities and other were number three, and overall, number three. So how can we do better? And to do that, we've got four great panelists today, and they're going to talk to us about some of the highlights, some of the good things about the ecosystems that they represent. We'll start with uh, Mike Maples. He'll talk uh, about the ecosystem in San Francisco. Katie Ray will talk about the ecosystem in Boston. Rafael Bras will talk about Atlanta. And finally, Eric Olson will bring us back to Texas and talk about the ecosystem here in Dallas. So first, let me uh, introduce Mike Maples. Mike is a partner at Floodgate. He has a uh, many successes. He has been named by um, one of the eight rising stars by Fortune magazine. He is a full-time investor. And Mike, we welcome your comments on the ecosystem. Okay, I'll, I'll try to go kind of quick. And I'm, I, I should start out by saying I'm always reluctant to suggest that I know more about something than how people should do things. So, uh, so I'm going to tread carefully. Uh, so I thought that maybe I would just express what I look for uh, from my perspective as an investor, and then see if there's ways that we could get in some trouble together. So, um, ba so I, I run a seed fund called Floodgate, and we invest too early, way too early, or legally ambiguous <laughs> too early in startups. So when we when we launched when Lyft launched, it was probably illegal, um, and you know Twitter they couldn't decide what they wanted to call it yet. Uh, Twitch started as Justin TV, Okta started as Sasher. And so when I, when I say that we're investing early, I mean super freaking early, like not, not just rhetorically saying that. And so, um, so why am I interested in research? Well, um, I'm a big fan of um, some of these uh, cyberpunk science fiction novels by William Gibson. And so I, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of William Gibson, but uh, he wrote this book called Neuromancer. And he has this one quote that I like, which is, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And um, the, the people that I look for at research institutions are people who are living in the future already. And um, ra rather than kind of too, too much of the horn about California and how awesome Stanford Berkeley are, I mean, I think they're doing a good job, but um, one of, my, one of my favorite examples is actually Mark Andreessen at the University of Illinois. And so he's in a supercomputer lab and people wanted to collaborate over the internet and they couldn't because it, it, it didn't work at the time. It wasn't useful to people. So he created the Mosaic browser and a web server, but to make the internet immediately useful for him. And so, so many times what you find is that these great breakthrough ideas happen with somebody living in the future. They notice what's missing. They have the hacking skills to build what's missing. 
And most of the world doesn't really think what they're working on is all that important. So when Andreessen built Mosaic, everybody thought that quote unquote digital superhighway would be defined by Time Warner and AT&T and all the big telcos and all the big cable companies, or should the government help build the superhighway? You know, I, I think I've heard Bob Metcalf tell me in the past that part of the reason he was at MIT was that Harvard wouldn't let him work on a project that he wanted to work on at Harvard. And so a, a lot of this stuff happens from the bottoms up. And the, and the reason that I bring that up is not to, not, not to say anything's wrong with what people are doing, but to suggest that sometimes the, the, the right thing to look for is those types of people, people who are living in the future, noticing what's missing and become obsessed with solving the problem. And the, the startup becomes a vehicle for them to keep solving the problem. And so um, most of those ideas don't seem important to people. Most of those ideas aren't liked by people. So the great startups are non-consensus and right, and they have some type of a counterintuitive understanding. So that's the, the, the main thing that I'm looking for is to figure out better ways to partner with research institutions to find those people who are living in the future and you know, help them unlock the power of that future as they bring us all into it quicker. Very good, thank you, Mike. So we'll have some time after all four of our panelists have a few minutes to have their introductory comments. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. Next is Katie Ray, CEO and managing partner of The Engine, and she'll give us the perspective from the other coast, from the Boston area. Katie? Wonderful, thank you, and thanks, Bob, for inviting me. Uh, very happy to be here. So the engine was born out of MIT. It's a, actually a for-profit spin-out venture capital fund from MIT. And most people, when you think of MIT, I mean, we have 86 entrepreneurial programs. There's all kinds of incredible research and startups that spin out every year. Um, and why would MIT need a, a venture capital fund that gets spun out of there? And I think if you look at what's happened with research and startups, you see two very frothy areas. One is in pure software startups, and I'll put these as like business model change startups. And then the other is in pharmaceutical, so small molecule development. We kind of know how to handle those two sets of innovation. But if you look at most of the other areas of breakthrough technological innovation, venture capital does not match up very well with it. Because most of the time, it is capital, more capital intensive and takes longer to get to market. And our fund structures are set up for 10-year time frames, even though we all know in venture that that's a little bit of a lie at this point. Um, most venture capital funds keep taking more and more time to return their capital. But nonetheless, when you write your first check into a company, you probably should think you can return that capital within the time frame of your fund. Uh, and so what happens, and if you were sitting at the top of MIT, what you're seeing is the most important inventions that could work on our problems or opportunities were not getting properly funded. And so you had a growing, what I would consider ambition gap amongst your PhD students, where they would say, yeah, I'm working on this really important thing that could solve something in human health or the energy you know, crisis or decarbonizing something, but who's gonna fund it? after the phil uh, philanthropic people or after the government. And, um, and so the question was, could we create a market intervention that would result in a highly successful venture capital fund um, because of the resources that a university like MIT could put against it? So could we give these types of entrepreneurs an unfair advantage which would increase their likelihood of success. So the engine kind of was born out of that. Um, and you know, the, after the last three years, we've been visited by universities all over the world to say like, how did you do it? Now, I am certainly do not believe we are at success yet, but we have made some real progress there. And I'll just name three things that I think are important pieces of progress. 
One is that we have created a dense ecosystem in what we call tough tech. People make fun of that name, but I think it's realistic. What we work on is tough tech. It's things like fusion and space and um, really next generation health platforms, et cetera, or quantum computing, all, all of these kind of real edges of innovation. Um, so that's the first thing is we have clustered both in space uh, so we've built out the first 30,000 square feet, 200,000 square feet are going to come online. And these are convergent spaces where you could build the technologies of tomorrow that are really complicated and, and require specialized equipment. And you could only do that in a venture capital fund um, if you're partnered with somebody like an MIT. You could obviously do that here in Texas, and I'm sure you do. Um, but they opened up you know, their balance sheet to allow us to do it. They also opened up all the equipment of the university for startups to use and work on. So I consider this first cluster everything about pulling people together and taking everything that was a fixed cost for a startup and making it variableized. Massively important to tough tech startups. You know, the second is clustering the entrepreneurs making a community for people working on these incredibly ambitious startups and things that could become foundational companies. They need each other, and they need to know when they look around the room that somebody else is doing it. And so by us bringing those people together, we think that's made a tremendous difference. And then the third is clustering capital. Because, I'm sorry, startups cannot only work, live on government funding. They, it's just impossible, or philanthropic funding. And so we have clustered capital, both our own venture capital fund, but trying to find like-minded people from all different uh, ilk of capital, whether that's corporate, you know, follow on government capital, family office, um, and regular old venture capital funds. And so that, I think, is what we're pushing into. Uh, and we've done 20 companies. They've all raised follow-on funding and some in very significant ways in these tough tech areas. And we're super excited about the future of what we can do. Um, I'll just say the last piece is that we bet on people. We are looking for entrepreneurs, people coming out of PhD programs who are going to run these companies. Obviously, they will need others around them that can help to build those businesses. But at the end of the day, the way we sort ideas, because obviously no venture capital fund could be an expert in all these areas, we sort them by people, people with deep ambition to change the world, who again, probably echoing Mike's comments, really think differently, but think massively ambitiously, um, which probably isn't really a word, but Very I'll good. end Thank with you, that. <laughs> Thank you. Next is uh, Dr. Rafael Bras. He is the provost and EVP for academic affairs at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Rafael? Well, first, thank you very much for having me here. I have enjoyed all the talks. So Bob, it's nice to see you after 15 years or so since <laughs> I last saw you. Uh, I'm going to talk about our approach. Our approach is, in, in a nutshell, is to try to create a transparent, intermingled, academic, private sector activity where the difference is lost. Uh, I want to also begin by giving one message. Uh, uh, one model doesn't fit all. So uh, not one size fits all, and we have to remember that. And there are, but there are some commonalities in, in what I think are those successful ecosystems to fill the gap. Some of the commonalities are critical mass. Population is important, uh, at least in my experience, uh, and, and the attractive infrastructure. Uh, I think a strong university center, like uh, we just heard, is, is, is crucial uh, because the, the, the education, not simply to produce manpower, but to create ideas is terribly important. Uh, the private sector in involvement, as it was just stated, is crucial in partnership. Uh, government presence is useful as a participant, not as oversight, in my opinion. Uh, willingness to take risks is, is absolutely essential. 
and resiliency because I don't know about you, but I am uh, I'm like baseball. If I'm batting 300, I'm doing well. Uh, and, and in essence, uh, the, the fact is that many times what you uh, come up with and your strategy turns out to be wrong. And you have to be able to pivot, to change, and refocus. Uh, success is also a mix of convergence of leadership and resources and persistence and staying power uh, of good strategy. But let's not forget also that luck plays a role. The, 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 the appropriate time, and there's a lot of luck into, into that and the people. Let me talk a little bit about Atlanta and Tech Square and Midtown Atlanta in particular. And the slide you see uh, in the upper right, you see a, a little sense of the nature of the activity going on in there. It's completely intermingled. I would say that approximately half of that whole area is occupied by academic enterprises and extension of Georgia Tech. It's right across the highway from the main campus. And the other half is, is private. And we, we're co-located, completely co-located. And no one academic institu a group owns the, any of this place. Uh, it started to illustrate a little bit of expansion about uh, our ability to change about 15 years ago. Uh, which really what I would call it was a defensive action. That area of Midtown was a disaster. It, it made our business harder because nobody dare walk in there. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. That's what it has been described to me and I've seen the pictures. Uh, so a, acquisition of real estate going across the interstate, creating facilities urban renewal with the idea of commercial value, but the whole strategy wasn't completely uh, thought out. The innovation as an ecosystem that, that, that resulted was spearheaded in part, interestingly, by the large corporation, the Fortune 500 companies that reside on the area of Atlanta. And they decided to put innovation centers there, 35 of them now, not all Atlanta ones, uh, that spurred innovation. AT&T, for example, a company that you know very well, had a major headquarter. Uh, Ralph de la Vega put an innovation center at Tech Square just a few blocks from their main headquarters. And the reason is he did not want it in headquarters. That was crucial. And I think that's, that's the, the, what I would call the, the logic. The integrated academic and business environment, university has to invest uh, I think we have done that quite proactively. The private-public activity, the collocation, there should be no difference in, in business leave and play. Uh, the risk-taking, bold decisions have to be taken, including buying whole built businesses that were already successful, and we decided that we needed that for startups, and that was done. Uh, and the, the, the constant attention into the programmatic activities of the institute. You can probably not read it there, but for example, our ambition is to spin out 300 student-driven companies every year. Uh, we are way on the way to get there, and we have programs like CreateX and Inventure and all that, that, that nurture that thinking, that philosophy. Uh, we're constantly thinking about young people, providing space for them, incubators, chair spaces, subsidies to make that possible. You need to create coalitions. So the denser, the better, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the, the more people we put there. And finally, persistence. Uh, we, are, we just finished Tech Square phase two in what we call the COVA complex. Uh, and we are about to begin Tech Square phase three, which is a similar investment. Thank you, Dr. Bras. Next, from Close to home here, we have Dr. Eric Olson, professor and chair, and I might note he was the founding chair of the Department of Molecular Biology, UT Southwestern Medical Center. Eric? Okay, so I'm the only Texan up here, so I'll give you <laughs> my uh, perspective on the future and, and the present of biotech uh, in Dallas, in particular in Texas in general. So I have a, a large laboratory at UT Southwestern here. I've dedicated my entire career to studying the development and the diseases and the regeneration of muscles, all the muscles in the body, skeletal muscles and, and the heart. 
And along the way, it became apparent that our basic science had many applications to human disease. In fact, many of the most devastating diseases of mankind are diseases of muscle and the heart, as many of you are aware. But you cannot develop a therapeutic or a drug or even a, a sophisticated new technology in an academic lab. Academic labs are built for free thinking, for training, for trial and error, and for functioning at the outer edge of knowledge. Companies are, are built for taking ideas from academia, optimizing them, and particularly with respect to drug development, performing toxicity studies and delivery studies and, and things of that nature. So it became apparent to me that to really see our work go as far as it could possibly go would necessitate launching some companies. And so over the past 20 years, I had the opportunity to found four different companies, uh, each of which was launched together with uh, myself and the key people in my lab who had made the foundational discoveries. And those companies evolved in many different ways, uh, ranging from uh, becoming publicly traded companies to uh, being acquired uh, to remaining uh, private. My, uh, the most recent uh, company that I was able to found was called Exonix Therapeutics. It's based on something that's the most exciting thing I've worked on in my career, and that is to use gene editing. This is a sophisticated technology where you can change down to a single letter in the DNA code, uh, an error in the DNA, and we apply that to the most devastating muscle disease, which is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is a disease that puts boys in wheelchairs by early ages and leads to death in the 20s. It's defied all, all efforts for a cure for more than 30 years. So we uh, started a company called Exonix Therapeutics built on ideas from our laboratory. And in particular, that company, we placed it in Boston, Massachusetts. And it went from uh, founding of the company at a Series A funding to a large acquisition by Vertex Therapeutics in 18 months. So that was a very fast uh, development. It was the best possible outcome for the technology. So there are many strengths in Texas that should enable the development of a robust biotechnology uh, industry. First, biotechnology has to be born from academia. I, I strongly believe that. And the state of Texas, as we've heard already at this meeting, has world-class, unparalleled academic institutions, including UT Southwestern, MD Anderson, and others. So the, the source for birth of companies uh, is here. The resources are here. Texans, there's a lot of, of uh, wealth in Texas, that, uh, and Texans are entrepreneurial in spirit. They're not afraid to uh, invest in uh, big ideas and big risks, and that's what biotech uh, is all about. And Texans, as uh, those of you who are from Texas uh, know, are loyal to Texas. We want to see Texas do great. And so it makes sense that biotechnology should be able to be developed here, just like uh, the many other uh, technologies that were developed here. So those are uh, the, the many strengths. So there are, what are the challenges to uh, building uh, biotechnology uh, in, in Texas? The challenge is the lack of a critical mass of, of individuals to make it happen. So although I am very loyal to Texas, I love it here and I'm never leaving, I do feel like a bit of a traitor because the four companies that I founded were all founded elsewhere. One in the Bay Area, one in Boston, <laughs> and, and uh, two in Boulder. Uh, not because I didn't want to put them in Texas, but an another challenge with starting a company is that from the time you start a company, the clock is ticking, and you, you can't waste a lot of time. And in my particular case, particularly the most recent one, I, it was a very competitive field and I, I needed to hit the ground running and I didn't want to waste time having to recruit people and so I just put it right in the heart of Boston and that was one of the reasons uh, that, it, that it was successful. But those, those are, are uh, challenges that can be, uh, that can be beaten, really. I, I think it takes a few successes, a few local successes. It takes an education. I know at our own university, we're working hard to, to educate the, the academic scientists about how to start a company and what it takes and the positives and negatives. And so if people become acquainted with this, uh, it will make things easier. In Boston and San Francisco, which are arguably the two real uh, epicenters for biotech in this country, 
this has taken several decades, for example. You, you mentioned clustering of, of companies. I think it's a really important point. There's a big clustering of companies in uh, Boston in an area called Kendall Square, which has basically outgrown its space now, and also in South San Francisco. And it's because when you put these people together, it creates like a think tank and just a hotbed of energy and ideas, and it. it's catalytic. And so I think that's what it takes. It takes just a few successes uh, in, in the area. And the, the final, this is, a, this is a significant challenge, but it's related to what I just said. One of the challenges with starting a biotechnology company is that you have to have expertise at every level, not just at the scientific level. We've got great young scientists here, that many of whom want to go into biotechnology, but you also have to have the vice president for regulatory affairs and for clinical development and for, you have to have CEOs and all these sorts of people. And in places like Boston and San Francisco, they're standing on every street corner. And in, uh, in uh, Dallas, uh, they're, they're not. But, you know, with a few successes, those things can, we can build momentum. And I really believe that. It just takes some time to do it. And it, I'm very excited about uh, something that's uh, been initiated at UT Southwestern together with uh, leaders in this uh, city, and that is to build a biotech incubator here in Dallas where we can really have the types of people there at every level that are thinking about ideas and pushing things forward and mutually reinforcing each other to uh, create this kind of vibrant environment, and I, I firmly believe that can happen. Very good. Thank you, Dr. All right, we have about seven or eight minutes for questions. If you have a question, please step up to one of the microphones. Here at the front of the room. Dr. Jha. Yeah. Yes, uh, Maura Bajra from uh, UT Austin uh, Aerospace Engineering. Um, <clears throat> very interesting uh, uh, takes from, from each of you. One of the things that I, I guess I, I'd love to hear your comments on is, you know, I've, I've done quite a bit of, of, of traveling around and, and uh, different countries looking at how innovation happens in different places. One of the things that uh, I feel distinguishes the United States from many other countries is uh, a lot of our industry is built on the backbone of small businesses and, and this sort of stuff, and we tend to be very proud of people that you know work out of their garage with big ideas and that sort of stuff. I have to say that um, more recently than not, it just seems like whenever I go to a conference, I'm pretty much tripping on CEOs. Everybody's a CEO, army of one. It seems like we're in this business of spray and pray. Spray, spray as many companies on the wall as possible and pray that some of them stick. Um, to what extent do you see venture capital and this sort of entrepreneurial spirit uh, able to uh, participate in things like public-private partnerships? Because the thing is, you know, from my perspective, I, I, I think role of government is really to retire risk, but there's a lot of risky stuff and not enough government funds per se to really, uh, you know, uh, completely envelop a problem. To what extent do you see this sort of VC entrepreneurial uh, aspect of things able to not just spin off companies but spin off public-private partnerships per se? I mean, maybe I'll jump in there since a lot of what we work on will require some type of public-private partnership. So if you look at you know, rebuilding our energy grid in the U.S. Uh, th those are very big projects um, that require a lot of capital. So if you're going to move from coal plants to fusion plants or even really deep geothermal, as Bob and I were talking about, those are going to require some type of public-private partnership, I think, to actually bring them online. So it's, a, it's an exciting area, but also one that is, um, is certainly tricky. I mean, we, you know, there, there have been some real disasters in public-private partnerships as well. Um, and I, I think the Obama administration certainly hit some of those uh, in, in thinking about uh, how do you bring those online. And it's not... I don't want to dissect that here, but I do think if the U.S. is going to lead in industries, it will require government partnership um, because we are competing globally. And certainly, if you look at China, you know it is it is almost all government partnership there. 
and some venture capital. Um, if we're going to compete, we're going to have to have, you know, large public capital in order to bring our companies online faster. And and I don't think, you know, we have to continue to develop that expertise. You know, we certainly at the engine think about that as something that we will have to become expert in as our companies grow. Um, and so we look at who's done that well. But I don't know if I answered your question, but I think it's super important. I, it, Thank you, Katie. Uh, yeah, I, let's see, we've got uh, Raphael and Mike both have a comment to very, that very quickly, think of the public-private also in, in creating the framework and facilitating the infrastructure that will generate the ideas and the businesses, not only uh, in it's the both. way that you yeah. just described it. All that we have done in Midtown Atlanta is that way. Uh, there, there's very few, very little of, the, of that infrastructure that, that is owned by the universities. Actually, almost all public-private. And, and, and the whole idea is to create the playing ground and then benefit from the outcome of the playing. Uh, but, so there, there's, there's a level below, before what you're talking about, but it's possible and successful. Thank you. Mike, do you have a comment? Yeah, well, I, I guess I, I would... Um, I would categorize the innovation in two different sort of buckets, right? So to me, if, 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 if all the folks in this room want to encourage more venture capital investment in ideas that are at their institutions, I think that what you want to do a better job of is nurturing the right kind of crazy, right? So like one of the advantages the Bay Area has is that people are encouraged to do crazy stuff. And, yeah. and you know, all startups are crazy. Right, they, they, they start out as a, a non-consensus and right idea by a crazy person who's obsessed, who just happens to be right. And so the venture capital model is purpose built for that because most people disagree with the crazy person and so they don't pay much attention to what they're doing and so they don't need to partner with a whole lot of people. They find a set of like-minded uh, soul mates who are kind of in on the secret with them and they go create a movement together and then once the world agrees with their secret, everybody joins the movement, you've got a, a great company. Th to me, the other type of innovation is, uh, I don't think is very well suited for venture capital. I, th I think that there are other funding models that we should explore as a country that would be better than what we're doing now. You know, we have trillions of dollars of cheap money circling the globe. And the last year, in 2018 at least, uh, Fortune 500 spent $800 billion buying back their own stock. And when you're doing that, you're abandoning all pretenses of being innovative. You're not even pretending. And so, like, we used to decide we're going to build a transcontinental railroad. We used to decide we're going to land on the moon. We're not mining asteroids. We're not uh, putting enough satellites up in orbit. We're not, we're not doing things you would do when the cost of capital is zero, which it is right now. And so uh, I believe if I wasn't doing this job, I would be trying to come up with a new funding model that allows us to go after really big ideas. And, um, and then the other part of that is, in this country, unfortunately, there's too much red tape. So if you had a great idea like that, you'd be better off implementing it in Dubai or Singapore or somewhere where you, you don't have to spend three years lobbying to even get a, a green light to do something meaningful. Great. And so, so the funding model plus kind of the, the red tape, I think, are things that we need to overcome. Thank you, Mike. Marie, Th did we get that? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. We have a second question. Hi, Cameron Cushman from the University of North Texas Health Science Center over in Fort Worth, just west of here. When we talk about, or when I talk about the importance of the ecosystem, uh, and the entrepreneurial and the innovation ecosystem, people in Fort Worth look at me like I'm crazy. It's politicians, it's funders, it's big corporations. Do you guys have any suggestions on how to uh, either talk about or actions to take to to try to break down the mystique of what an entrepreneurial ecosystem is and, and talk about its importance? Okay, we have about a minute for this, this answer. <laughs> that was a big question. So be quick. Uh, thank you for the question. Any volunteers? Eric, do you want to address uh, I think it comes back to education. People need to understand what entrepreneurialism is and what, what it takes. It's about uh, Lack of, you can't have any fear of failure. You have to have a big idea and you, you have to, it takes, always takes a believer. There has to be one person that is completely committed to this at all costs and will drive it forward or it won't work. And I think 
that has to be bridged with people who believe in that person's vision, and then if you put enough funding behind it and you get real lucky, it can work. You, you may want to take some of those non-believers to some of the places where it works, oh, and when you see the 15,000, 20,000 people very well employed, paying taxes, and happily so, and producing new ideas, um, people get convinced pretty quickly. I'm going to say something a little bit controversial maybe, but I just don't think those people matter. Uh, I think that, like, Google, Google didn't happen because funding of, you know, that the, the, the conventional thinkers thought that Stanford needed more attention uh, in some way. It happened because people like David Sheridan and Andy Bechtelsheim recognized the cleverness of it. And so I think that the, a lot of this is about a cultural advantage of celebrating crazy in the right way and uh, understanding who at these academic institutions has, has a nose for the right kind of crazy and is able to pick out those folks and to, and to understand those people are important like artists are important. And, um, you know, but I just don't think that uh, convincing people who don't get startups that they should care more I think even if you convince them, they don't know what to do. They don't understand startups. Very good. Thank you, Mike. And I'm Thank sorry, you. but we're out of time for questions. Our panelists may be around for lunch if you'd like to talk, speak with him. But uh, thank you, panel.